Thank you. Thanks for the chance. Just to spend a few minutes uh, with you, if you're seeing the program, I'm, I'm the last 20 minutes between you and the socializing afterwards, all right? That's the enviable spot on the program. I insisted on having that. No. Um, I, I just want to make a few remarks, and I, I grabbed the program back there while I was waiting, and it says the title of my remarks are the implications of digital, digital vulnerabilities to our national security. And it, it just struck me that, um, boy, that hardly needs much explanation in, in, in terms of what vul vulnerabilities have done most recently. Let me just walk through a, a, a couple, all right? So you had the, the DNC thing, remember? You, you read about it in the paper? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I was actually doing some interviews uh, on camera today for, for future use, and they, they asked me to walk, walk them through the DNC hack, all right? And, and I point out, first of all, I, I know how much we're talking about identity here and, and, and so on. And so they get into the DNC and into John Podesta's emails, all right, by, by assuming other identities, by, by, by getting in, and then stealing, it must have been thousands and thousands of emails, clearly the Russians, I think we're all in agreement, right? The Russians then take the information, by the way, so far, all that's happened is what I, I am forced to, t to call honorable international espionage, all right? Because <laughs> I gotta tell you, if I'm still the director up at Fort Meade and I could get, get the private emails of a major political party and another geopolitical competitor, hey, game on, I'm going after those things in a minute. But then the Russians took the fruits of honorable international espionage and then weaponized it in a really, really hideous way. I mean, you're familiar with this, but just to recount, Number one, to mess with our heads, which they did. Number two, to erode confidence in our electoral processes, which they did. Uh, three, to punish the former Secretary of State, which they did. And, and, and by the way, these were rolling objectives. You know, they kind of they kind of morphed as the thing went forward. And and down near the end, this thing is going so well. And I got to tell you, as a professional, this has got to be the best, most no, that's not right, the most effective covert influence campaign in the history of covert influence campaigns, okay? And down in the end, they think this is going so well, I said, hey, what the hell? Let's just put our thumb on the scale and, and, see, and see what happens. I can't think of any digitally enabled assault on the United States that cuts more fundamentally to the core identity of what this nation is than what the Russians just pulled off. And it all began with passwords and hygiene and just sloppiness. Uh, another attack recently, Sony, uh, North America, you're very familiar with that. And, and there, I, I, when I do this with slides in, in a longer format, I talk about cyber sins. You know, there's stealing your stuff, corrupting your stuff, crashing your network, and creating physical harm. And, and here, I, the North Koreans did, did all four, all right? They, they stole data, they destroyed data, they crashed the network, not quite physical harm, but just close enough. I grew up in an industrial area uh, in, in Pennsylvania. The most frightening thing I ever heard as a teenager is, Hayden, I know where you live, and I know what kind of car you drive, okay? <laughs> the Sony employees were getting notes from the attackers, I know where you live, I know what kind of car you drive, and I know where your daughter goes to school, which, you know, is a, a, a vile attack. Um, by the way, these are the two attacks in which our government has decided we are going to name the attacker. All right, we've identified the Russians in my first example. We've identified the North Koreans in, in my uh, second example. I still remember, and, I, and again, I tell this in the longer form, President Obama goes out there and dimes out the North Koreans formally and officially in the press room, and I'm watching and say, all right, wait right on, Mr. President. That's, uh, I was just kind of applauding the speech until so he gets to the part where, where he, he, he actually says, and this was a particularly vile form of cyber vandalism. And I go, vandalism? That's what you do with a subway car in New York and spray paint. <clears throat> Come on, Mr. President, just, just, call, just, just say what this is. This was a horrible act of cyber. That was two years ago. And I have yet to finish my own sentence, <laughs> which, which I think is one of the thoughts I, I wanted to, to share with you. But hold, hold that blank there just, just for a minute, all right? The, the two other digitally enabled assaults on us that have been most recently mentioned, um, Bradley, Chelsea Manning, and Edward Snowden. You know, look, we, we, we've had un, unreliable people and stupid PFCs in American Army since Valley Forge. 
but the damage done by these two is only made possible in, in the digital era, in, in what they could do in terms of harm. In each one of the instances I've given you, it's about identity. It was identity getting through, and, and in for the, the Manning-Snowden thing, it, it, it was the insider threat, which is its own form of an identity problem in, in that, you know, the first two is you get an outsider who assumes the persona of an insider, and the last one is an insider already there who decides to go rogue, but it's, it's identity. And I, I know you've, you've covered this, and it's more, than, it's more than just access, it's monitoring, and it's audit, and, 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 and so on, but, you, but you, get, you get the flavor. Okay, the last panel, uh, they, they took the slide down, but the last panel was talking about transition, and I was in the back and, and, and listening to it. This is a, what they call an inflection point. We've got a new administration coming in. Um, you know, things are more malleable today than they were one, three, six, or 12 months ago. So I just want to quickly go through four or five points, just very briefly. Not just reinforcing what you've heard so far, but appealing to you as the professionals you are to get on the field and play because, again, at an inflection point, at a transition with the new administration, there's more space to maneuver. There's more room to, to set off in, in new directions. So, so a couple of things, just to very, very quickly share with you. Um, I, know you I know you're professionals. I, I broadly know your background. Even folks like yourselves, I think, underappreciate how disruptive all this stuff is. I did this out in Vegas about five or six years ago. I'm talking to Black Hat. All right, and I'm, I'm leaning on the edge of the stage here at Caesar's Palace at 3,000 <clears throat> claiming to be reformed hackers, okay? <laughs> and I, I begin with, you know, I, I think this digital thing's getting traction. <laughs> and you know, they gave me polite laughter. My punchline to them was even you guys don't recognize how disruptive this is. Even you are selling short how much of a change this is making uh, on our lives. I know many of you from the Department of Defense, right? Um, your doctrine says land, sea, air, space, cyber. An entire new domain, for, for us it's a warfare, but fundamentally an entire new domain of human existence. Okay? That's really disruptive. I mean, we go back to your Western Civ courses or maybe your American history courses, when the Europeans discovered this hemisphere, that was a big deal. But this is even more fundamental than that. So no, number one, keep in mind how disruptive it is. It is so disruptive that we haven't got the big ideas right now. I was listening to the back end of the panel and talking about very specific, necessary, operational steps to take, and we're going to go do that. But I do think our operational vocabulary and our operational maturity of thought are further along than our big idea maturity of thought. Okay, remember I told you keep that blank in mind. Come on, Mr. President, step up and say what it is. It's a horrible act of cyber, and I still don't know how to fill it in. Yeah, we don't, we have not yet arrived at mutually agreed categories of activity. And you realize once you've identified an activity by category, the response, not quite sui generis appears, but you have a pretty good idea of where the response ought to go. So if something bad happens in the cyber domain in the next 12 hours, probably will, um, and our newspapers cover it tomorrow, they will call it a cyber attack. And those of you who work in this business know that actually when we do stuff, we have a far more narrow definition of, of attack um, than, than they do. And, and that lack of precision, again, I'm appealing to you as professionals to help with the national dialogue, that lack of precision confuses our thinking because our categorization is, is, is really, really fuzzy. Same thing has to do with really fundamental concepts like deterrence. What does that look like? Because we, we generally take our concepts of deterrence down here and just flip them up here and say, there you go. And of course, you all know that that doesn't work. Even concepts of privacy, okay? What constitutes a reasonable expectation of privacy up here? And you know, the real answer is, we don't know. We're, nah, that's not fair. The real answer is we haven't decided. The real answer is we got a lot of opinions. 
Which brings me to kind of, kind of a third point, and I, I know you're all government folk, or most all government folk, but one of the things we've not yet decided is what is the appropriate role of government up here? Okay, we, and, and again, some, I, I'm 39 years in government, I just kind of naturally assumed that, well, the appropriate role up here is the same role we had down here, which I'm now convinced is probably not true. All right? So, I mean, the, the, the macro question I'd, I'd share with you, and, and one again, I want you to participate in the resolution, is we as a people, you know, the big we, not the 300 we, the 320 million we, have not yet decided what it is we want or what it is we will allow the government to do up here in the cyber domain. It does not transfer very easily. <clears throat> I just live up the road in McLean. So, you know, imagine I'm there tonight, I can't sleep, I get up, I walk out to the upstairs window, I look out there and I see a Fairfax County police car going by and he's putting a light on the shrubbery, right? My thought is, I like that. That is my tax dollars at work. God bless you, Fairfax County. Now, you imagine whatever it is you think the digital equivalent is and there's nobody in this room going, hallelujah. We, and, and so we, we really need to be, we need to be careful about that. It's going to sound a little political, but I'm out of government. <laughs> 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 President Trump, uh, last Thanksgiving Eve, issued a, a kind of a manifesto of five or six things he was going to do early on in office. He's starting to work his way through the list now, a Trans-Pacific Partnership and so on. One that really struck me, and it is, I'm being critical here, so forewarning, okay? One that really struck me was I am going to task the Department of Defense to come up with a national strategic plan to defend critical American infrastructure and deliver it to me within, what, three months? Yeah. No, bad answer. Okay? I mean, first of all, you know, statutorily, that's not DOD's job. That's Homeland Security's job. And political, culturally, you and I ain't wanting Marines up and down South Hay Street here, or the digital equivalent of Marines defending the cyber domain. So it's going to be really interesting. And again, I'm appealing to you as professionals to get in there and play. It's going to be really interesting how this shakes out, given that kind of DOD, go fix this. I, by the way, Jim Mattis is really smart. He, he knows this is not a good, good place for him to go. So it's going to be a fascinating, fascinating dialogue. Uh, another major point, and I heard it near the end of your last panel, and one I really want to kick the podium about because I think it's really, really important, and, and that is the role of the private sector. If we're still scratching our heads as to what government's doing up here, we, we Americans don't hang around. The government's not showing up. We start to self-organize, and we use business models to guide our self-organization because we found that business models actually make you most efficient. And so the private sector has an how to put it this way. We are going to have to rely on ourselves and on the private sector for security up here in a way that we have not relied on ourselves for security down here since the closing of the American frontier in the 1880s. Okay. Let me, let me go one more, one more turn of this. Um, it's a little stark, and maybe I'm giving you 5% of exaggeration, but I, but I really do think this is true. So bear with me. You know, who's, who's prime up here for doing what we want to do, doing what you've been talking about, which is security? And I think it is the private sector, not the government. Now, I'm a 39-year government guy. So when I'm at NSA, even at DNI, a little bit at CIA, I'm thinking we, the government we, really have as powerful a role up here as we've had down here when it comes to security. And I no longer believe that to be the case. Down here, government is on lead. I mean, I'm not going to pull you through a political science philosophy course here, all right? But fundamentally, you and I have given up the right to personal violence in order to defend ourselves and transferred it to the government. And we now trust the government to defend ourselves. And in, except in extreme cases, you and I are not authorized to use violence to, to protect ourselves down here, all right? Maybe not the same. So here's how I reason through it, and most of you DOD will get it. You, you know, when, a, when an office order come out, comes out, we, we get a paragraph called organization and command, and in that paragraph, we talk about the supported commands and the supporting commands. You are the supported command, you are the supporting commands, 
right? Who's, who's prime, who's secondary? Uh, since we're in Virginia, uh, I'll, I'll run it back a century and change. Robert E. Lee, Ulysses S. Grant, your core, sir, your core is the main body. And gentlemen, gentlemen, you will conform the movements of your core to the movements of the main body. Right? And again, my, my assumption was, just like down here, the main body up here is the government. I am now convinced that except in a very thin veneer of very, very extreme cases, the main body up here is the private sector. Which, if you're half listening, then suggests that you are the supporting commands in government, not the supported. And that leads to some really interesting discussions. Um, one, I, I, I won't keep you much longer, um, but one uh, has the, the, the whole Apple, Jim Comey, Tim Cook, San Bernardino encryption thing, right? And it, it surprised quite a few people that Mike Hayden, Mike Chertoff, Keith Alexander, a whole bunch of folks, really kind of security people, actually sided with Apple, okay? And we did not do it on privacy grounds. He's dead. I mean, he doesn't have any privacy rights, okay? Uh, we didn't do it on authority grounds. I actually think the government had the authority to tell Cook to open the phone. We did it. By the way, we arrived at this independently, all right? Um, McConnell and Chertoff and I actually discovered we each arrived at this position independently. But our, but our logic was, was, was simply, if you have to believe my support dead, supporting, and so on and so forth, you may want to think three or four times for even legitimate counterterrorism law enforcement requirements, and that certainly was true, all right? Even for those legitimate requirements, you might want to think three or four times before you make it harder for the private sector to do what it was I just told you only the private sector can take care of for us. Okay? So th th there are circumstances in which I would say, oh no, open the damn phone, okay? But not for forensic value post-crime wrapping up the investigation. That, you see what I'm doing? I'm balancing security needs here. And I'm just saying in this instance, the global cyber security needs of the American people trumped, kind of have to start using another word there. <laughs> Weighed the advantage over here on security grounds, which is a real inversion of, of, of thinking. But again, even security types end up over here. No, don't kick the door in. Again, for security. So I invite you to play in that, all right? I mean, all these things I've suggested. Um, take advantage of what you've shared here this morning and this afternoon, but, but more fundamentally, who it is you've become, the professionals that you have developed yourselves into to, to contribute to this dialogue. One, one final, final, final request, really, really important. Speak English when you do it, okay? Actually, actually take, take into consideration the audience you are talking to, all right? I have been in the sit room with cabinet level officials you know, um, who are getting briefed on a potential cyber this or cyber that, all right? And, and I, 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 can read, I can read eyes, all right? And I'm thinking about three or four sentences in, the secretary of whatever or something or other is, is thinking, this guy sounds like um, Rain Man. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then about sentence 12, I can, see the, I can see the lights coming on. Damn, he is Rain Man. <laughs> It, so it, it, it is really necessary for people with the technical knowledge you have to express that kind of knowledge for at least a generation. Yeah, you, you're going to grow up and you're going to have those jobs and th then you don't have to do that anymore. You're all going to understand it. But the people up there now don't. And so you really do need to, to take your expertise but express it in a way that's digestible by the 60 or 70 something liberal arts major who's controlling the department of important stuff, <laughs> okay? All right, w with that, I, I know you had a great day. I will get out of the way between you and the socializing. Thanks so much for allowing me to come and do a little sermonizing. <laughs>